men who conquer twice, who meet the arms and armor of their sullen foes and conquering once, deal more than one defeat, who stricken rise to strike still braver blows. Who are these champions of the second start? The steadfast wearers of the Purple Heart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an excited and privileged moment for all of us in the studio here tonight. Every week at this time, we're going to present the thrilling and inspiring stories of our men of war who fell in battle and stood up again. You'll know their gallantry in the face of the enemy and in the face of life. For these will be the men who wear the splendid emblem that America gives to those who suffer wounds in battle for her. They're the men who wear the Purple Heart. You'll hear their stories, and you'll hear them. But now, by way of proving that the accent is on life and the pursuit of happiness, may I give you the happy and lively... Would you like to swing on a star? Carry moonbeams home in a jar? Virginia Ellen, Ginny Sims was born in San Antonio, Texas, on May 25, 1913. Her family moved to California, where she attended Fresno High School and Fresno State Teachers College. There she studied piano and began performing. Singing with her sorority sisters, she formed a popular vocal trio. In 1932, Sims became the vocalist for the Tom Guerin Band in San Francisco. In 1934, she joined the Kay Kaiser Orchestra, receiving her first national exposure on his radio program. So would you rather be a pig? Sims appeared in three films with Kaiser. That's Right, You're Wrong in 1939, You'll Find Out in 1940, and Playmates in 1941. On April 6, 1941, Sims and Kaiser co-starred in an original comedy, Niagara to Reno, on CBS's Silver Theater. The two nearly married, but upon breaking up, she left his orchestra in September. Just a few days later, on September 19, 1941, Sims was on CBS solo for five minutes at Fridays at 9.55. Then on Tuesday, September 8, 1942 at 8 p.m., she took to the air with her own show for Philip Morris. Originally called Johnny Presents, it was later changed to the Purple Heart Show, with an emphasis on wounded and decorated servicemen. Edgar Cookie Fairchild led the orchestra. She starred in more films, including Here We Go Again in 1942, Hit the Ice in 1943, and Broadway Rhythm, which premiered in January of 1944. On Independence Day 1944 at 8 p.m., Sims took to the air with her Purple Heart show. Opposite in New York, CBS aired Big Town, and both ABC and Mutual aired News Commentary. England was behind in the summer darkness, England in the dark channel, the channel secretly alive with ships and men and the implements of vengeance. Gone too was the great transport plane. Only the darkness remained, and Sergeant John G. Rooney's parachute floating above him as he sank down silently to the French earth. France below, invasion below. This is it. This is it. This is it. This is it. Out of the sky over Mare St. Eglise, paratrooper John Rooney swung and floated, his comrades around him in the night. Earthward. Earthward. Then... What are you thinking, Sergeant John Mooney, as the tracer bullets fly? What are your thoughts as you swim down the long channel of the sky? Tracer bullets. There go some of the boys limping their harness. They're hit. They're hit, and I'm sorry and mad. Curtains for the kids. I want to get down there and put those machine guns out of business. I don't like them. I'm against them. I'm anti-machine gun. 
Put him out before the glider infantry arrives. That's the ticket. Punch it with your Tommy gun, Johnny G. Rooney. Hey, yes. Yes, are you okay? Oh, fine, fine, I'm fine. Let's shoot somebody. Look, we gotta knock out those two German machine guns on the ridge. Sure, let's knock the Hitlers on the head, huh? We've gotta use grenades. See, nothing of it, I can get them free. I know a fella. Okay, you ready? Ready, Chief. All right, keep low. Come on. Sergeant Rooney flips his grenade at the astonished Hitlers. <laughs> Private Yus Rosen lets fly his grenade. Good hunting, yes! Take the rest with the bayonets! Come on! Later, their friends crouch at a roadside, waiting for Nazi cars to roll by. I can't wait for them to roll over those mines we planted. <laughs> Some prank, ain't it? Quiet. Here comes a car now. Rooney, I'll match you for the tires. Shut up. What tires? How many were in that car, yes? Four. How many in those machine gun nests? Eight. A dozen dead Nazis. Shelled 12. We'd better start keeping count. Well, I think we're on our way. Come on. Later, the men reached their objective, a bridge, well guarded by German troops and German machine guns. And now Johnny Rooney doesn't like machine guns. He's anti-machine gun. They make a loud noise and sometimes hurt the wrong people, see? There's only one way we can take those two guns, and that's by frontal assault. Oh, murder. Yeah. Volunteers? Hey, I'll go with you. Nine okay, men on. rush come the on. guns. Four right. men make it and finish the job with knives. And then they turn their own guns on the bridge, expecting the German counterattack and getting it. Rooney, you're piling up those clouds so deep we can't get out the others. They'll have to climb over their own. The men are dead to get at us, won't they? Yeah, you're right. Hey, Sarge, look at tanks. Huh? Captured French light tanks. All right, I know what to do for them, too. The 50 caliber machine gun. Let them have it, boys. Come on! For 15 grueling days full of sound and fury, Sergeant John Rooney and his men beat their way toward Cherbourg. Behind him, Sergeant Rooney leaves a toll of 504 dead Nazis. And then, near the coast, the Allied barrage from the sea howled over their heads. The Germans were throwing a lot of heavy stuff back. They say you never hear the shell that has your particular number on it. You hear the other fellow's doom, and he hears yours, but there's nothing buddies can do about it. Except be sorry. Sorry it had to happen. It was queer. There was Sergeant Rooney's shoe rolling away from him, skipping and rolling, hoppity hop. And the sergeant himself sitting on the ground. It was queer. Presently, an aid man came and put a tourniquet on Johnny's leg, and then everybody moved forward to the assault. And Johnny Rooney lay back quietly, and for a long time, he watched the shell burst on the hills far off. Now I lay me down to sleep. Pray the Lord. My soul to keep. My soul reigns. And sleds and multitudes of little tin soldiers painted red. Remember? Hey, hey, stretch you here on the double. This one's bad. And Sergeant Johnny Rooney began that long journey back through all the echelons of tenderest med medical service. Back, back across the ocean and America to this very studio now, tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnny presents in person Sergeant John Rooney, wearer of the Purple Heart. Sergeant John 
John Rooney is here beside me. He wears a purple heart for having shed his blood fighting his country battles. He also wears a, a nervous smile, and both become him very well. Johnny, we're very, very worried. Uh, were you very worried uh, while you were lying wounded there in Normandy? <laughs> no, Jenny, I wasn't worried. Just scared, plain scared. <laughs> well, you didn't limp very much when you came to the mic. Much? <laughs> Hardly at all. My new foot's just as good as new. Well, what are you planning to do now that you're out of the Army? I'm doing it. I know, but I wanted you to tell the people, will you? Well, I'm driving a mean truck. Not as mean as I used to, though. Why? Well, a boss always said I was a reckless driver. He always used to say, Rooney, you'll kill someone one of these days. <laughs> how true, how true. Well, do you feel handicapped at all driving your truck now, Johnny? Handicapped? Well, I'll tell you. I can keep my foot on the gas for these long hauls, and it never gets tired. Isn't science wonderful? <laughs> I'll tell you something else about these mock feet. No corns. <laughs> well, that's one way of thinking about it. And I think that all the people out there can see what we mean when we call these men of the Purple Heart the men who conquer twice, who take all the battlefield can give them and come out of their corner again in the civilian round, both fists swinging. Thanks, John G. Rooney of the 82nd Airborne Division and the Purple Heart. More power to you. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, you too. <laughs> Tuesday is Valentine's Day on the Purple Heart program. If you'll give it a moment's thought, you'll see it makes sense. No? Yes. And so, for Sergeant Rooney and other stout-hearted men of the Purple Heart, a Valentine. a heart-to-heart -heart chat for connoisseurs of cigarettes. Frank? Thank you, Jenny. There's a lot of wisdom in some of the old sayings most of us have known from childhood. Right now, I'm thinking of one that sums up the vital superiority of Philip Morris cigarettes. And that is, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, isn't it sensible to change your cigarette before you pay the smoking penalties? We've never claimed for Philip Morris any curative power, but in Philip Morris, you do get that ounce of prevention, far less irritation to the smoker's nose and throat, scientifically proved. Now, you're entitled to know the source of that proof. First, laboratory research has proved Philip Morris far less irritating than four other leading cigarettes. But that's not all. The findings of a group of distinguished doctors show that when smokers change to Philip Morris, 
substantially every case of irritation of the nose or throat due to smoking cleared up completely or definitely improved. Full reports of these findings have appeared in authoritative medical journals for the information of doctors. On this high and impartial authority, we say to you, Philip Morris are proved far less irritating, therefore safer for the nose and throat. Philip Morris superiority is recognized by eminent medical authorities. No other cigarette can make that statement. Remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The year was 1923, the fabulous years of the mighty champions. Big Bill Tilden and his cannonball service, Babe Ruth, Jack Dempsey, the marathon dance craze, Lon Chaney and the Hunchback of Notre Dame, the era of wonderful nonsense. That was the year when Barney Google's uh, singularly unathletic looking nag got into the great Abba Dabba handicap, and when the horses ran that day, Spark Plug ran the other way. Barney Google with the goo goo googly eye. The super optimists of 1923 must have been wrong because it was certainly raining like all get out on the field of San Pietro, Italy in the, in the winter of 1943, 20 years later, and raining hard. All kinds of rain, water, iron, steel, complete with thousands of thunders and lightnings to match. And lying in that unanticipated rain was Robert E., the son of Watson, born in that bright, that cheerful, that slightly idiotic year of 1923. I've got to fix it. I've got to get it fixed. Robert's right foot had been badly smashed. His left leg, too, was bleeding. His hands were heavily bandaged and bandages soaked with mud and rain. And Private First Class Robert Watson was trying to fix his field radio so that the riflemen of his outfit could receive battle orders. I've got to fix it. i got to. I, I... And hit him there in the sticky, cold mud of San Pietro Battlefield. Now, stay there, Sonny. We'll be back for you. See? Yeah, with the pliers. Pliers. Fix it. I've got to fix it. For five hours, the gravely wounded boy worked on the radio. Robert Watson, born in the loony 20s, but himself a responsible 20, worked in the mud and the rain, and oh, how it rained. Well, lots of boys have grown up and taken on the stern accoutrements of war and gone out into the rain that wasn't gonna rain no more. And some of them got soaking wet and got sent home, like Private First Class Watson. And here he is to take his place in the sun again. Ladies and gentlemen, Johnny presents, in person, Private First Class Robert Watson, wearer of the Purple Heart. <laughs> Private Watson is here beside me, ready to bandy words with us. So, are you ready, Private Watson? Ready, Jenny. Begin banding. Well, you bandy first until I get the hang of it. Well, tell me, what ailed the radio out there, Robert? Chill, Blaine's? Well, you know, Jenny, I don't know till this day. Well, didn't you feel any pain from all those wounds while you were trying to uh, make that wireless talk? Well, I didn't feel a thing that I can remember. Well, nothing mattered but getting that radio in repair. That's all, Jenny. You got two medals for that little deed, didn't you, Bob? Oh, well. The DSC and the Purple Heart, right? Oh, all right. Well, tell me, which do you like better? Or is that a foolish question? No, I like the Purple Heart. How come, Robert? Well, you can get the DSC for being a hero and not get a scratch on you, far as I know. And the Purple Heart? Well, to get the Purple Heart, you've got to bleed, brother. Mm. Well, you're still spending some time in the hospital, right? That's right, studying in my spare time, which is always. Studying what? Radio engineering. I'm going to know what kept that box from talking if I never do anything else. <laughs> Oh, uh, you're gonna, you're making uh, radio engineering your career then? That's about it, Jenny. Well, nifty for you, Robert. It's a good scheme because they do tell me that radio's here to stay. 
Thank you, Robert Watson of the United States Army and the Purple Heart. The most of the best to you, Bob. Thanks, Jenny. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs> And that was another of the winners of the Purple Heart, America's symbol of her gratitude to her wounded soldiers ever since George Washington said that's the way it's going to be. For the likes and for the liking of Robert Watson and his courageous kind, I have a song. It's a song full of the, de of the determination of these men who came back to look forward. Once upon a time when most of us had died, an old soldier at the judgment seat applies for entrance. Show me, the stern one said, some proof that you are choice among the dead, some saintly act, some holy skill or kindly art. Only this, O oh magistrate, O oh king, O oh God. My life blood for my country stained the sod. For proof, I have this purple heart. He gazed long at it, the king, all mankind's matter. Then nodding, whispered softly, enter. Jenny Sims will be back in just a moment. In closing this evening, a special word on behalf of our sons and daughters, husbands and sweethearts serving in the fighting forces. A huge part of our entire production of Philip Morris cigarettes is going to them to provide them a little extra relaxation and enjoyment when they need it so very much. So if you can't get Philip Morris every time you ask for them, keep on asking until you do. Be as loyal to Philip Morris as Philip Morris is to our boys and girls overseas. Remember that when you call for Philip Morris, made by Americans in America for America's fighting forces. Philip Morris, 
America's finest popular-priced cigarette. This is Johnny again, returning now to the thousands of store windows and counters all over America. Look for me. I'll be waiting for you. Come in and call for Philip Murray. Goodbye, Johnny. We'll be seeing you in the windows and on the counters during the week. And hearing you over the same station next week at this time.